So, 10 principles for better, uh, building better products. Uh, there I am, excellent. Thanks so much for joining us right after lunch. I know I was a bit rushed. I didn't eat yet, just to give you my full attention, but I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, I want to talk first a bit about who I am and why I think I can talk to you about building better products. So um, I have been a product manager for about six years. I actually have an engineering background before that. I work for SoundCloud building products of all shapes and sizes from very UI uh, centric things like the embedded player that you see at the top to very tech driven things like what I'm currently working on, which is content ID and copyright service. So we do all the fingerprinting, the machine learning around identifying what stuff is uh, copyrighted and the workflows around that. So why this talk? Um, when I was trying to decide on a topic, I realized I could talk for ages about SoundCloud's amazing international growth strategy, but it's also rooted in the stage we're already at, which has taken something like eight years to get to, that it wouldn't be very useful for you. So my objective for this talk today is actually to help you avoid the banana peels of product management by giving you some principles to help you make better decisions and share some of the things I've learned and some of the mistakes I've made so you can not make them and, again, make better decisions. So jumping right in. Number one, treasure user input. So user input is basically your precious for those of you who watch Lord of the Rings. Um, the key to user input is that at the stage that a user has actually taken the time, the effort, the mental energy, uh, the creativity to input, for example, long amounts of text or to customize uh, their application that they've been using with you for a long time, that is so valuable that you really need to make sure that you do not lose that. And I'll give you an example for this, right? Imagine you're building a learning platform um, where anybody can sign up to become a teacher. Um, for example, if you're good at cooking, if you're good at coding or sewing, whatever it is, you can sign up and start teaching people and make some money that way. Now, to be useful on that platform, you actually have to fill in a pretty long profile, right? So people will only actually sign up for a class with you if they feel you're representing yourself well. So you go in and you write a profile, you really think hard about how you're going to make yourself sound like this amazing teacher. And then at the bottom, there's a thing that says, you're located in New York City, so we're registering you as a teacher there. And you go, wait a second, I'm not based in New York City. And then there's a small link that says, change city. And you click on that link, and you're on the next page, and all of your text is lost. And I swear to God, I wish that hadn't actually happened to me because I was so angry, but it did happen to me. And it was a startup I was mentoring. And you can trust me that, first of all, I was in a rage fit. And second of all, I told everyone I knew that I would never, ever try that product again, right? So very small thing, huge consequences. You're losing a user that you've spent a lot of marketing time, a lot of energy on getting onto your platform. And with a very small thing, you're actually alienating them completely. And there's very simple guards against this, right? The brute force approach is the pop-up that also Facebook use, where it says, hey, do you really want to leave this site? There's still stuff entered in here. A much more elegant approach is to just quietly cache it so that the user can pick up from where they left off, which is really kind of the more advanced way of handling this situation. And finally, if you have the chance to onboard using existing information, for example, by signing in with LinkedIn, that is actually even better because Less effort, less risk of using the user at any given time in your onboarding flow. Moving on to number two. Observe real people as often as you can. This is a wonderfully cheesy image of a uh, product safari. So basically, the idea is to make sure you observe real people using what it is you build as often as you can. And the reason that's important is because Nothing quite communicates the despair that users feel when they use your product if something's broken as actually observing them doing it, right? So I vividly remember being in a user research session. We'd build a new product. We thought it was fairly good. And then users were just like, I don't get it. I'm so sorry. I'm doing this wrong, right? Like, this is not working. And just the urgency you feel when users just cannot understand your product is very different from reading a piece of text that says, our onboarding flow is broken, right? So not only should you get in front of real users, but try and get everyone in your company in front of users as often as you can, because that really communicates very well what's working, what is it, and why you're even doing this. Um, to actually put this in practice, if you don't have the capacity to do more formal user research, 
Guerrilla user testing is a nice way. So go into a cafe, somewhere where you think your normal users would hang out, put your product in front of them, and see how they react to it. Um, and once you're across a certain scale, places like Reddit are also really nice, because on Reddit, people will still, uh, tell stories about your product, but they're not feeling observed. So they're honestly sharing what happened instead of being like, you know, oh, you're watching me. I have to tell you something good now. So I can wholeheartedly recommend that you observe users as often as you can. Understand user motivation. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because I found that there's a huge difference in products depending on whether for any given thing that a user does, you're dealing with intrinsic motivation or extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is anything where users have a natural reason why they might want to do it. Learning, growth, being social, all these kinds of things. External motivation is anything that you're basically trying to get the user to do so that your product works or your business model works, right? Or, for example, very repetitive factory work, this kind of stuff. <coughs> now, the key thing is that when you have intrinsic motivation, which is incredibly valuable, and you then start applying predictable reward mechanisms like gamification on top of it, you're actually destroying that intrinsic motivation and you're turning it into work. So imagine, I, I love reading, I actually do. I read a lot. Now, if my Kindle constantly told me, oh, you read 16 chapters, you know, how about two more? Oh, you read 18 chapters. Oh, your friends read two more books than you do. Why don't you read a little more? That would completely annoy me and ruin all of the intrinsic motivation that I have. So what's really important then is that you understand where in your product you have things where you can bank on intrinsic motivation and try and just gently foster that and then get out of the way, basically. And where are the points where you, know, you really have to encourage people to do something that they don't necessarily feel they want? And the interesting thing is that may not always be the same spot for every single person. So that's very tricky, but it's super helpful. And something else that I've realized is that basically user motivation in extra, uh, extrinsic areas is super difficult to predict. It's incredibly difficult to predict for me what you're going to do to do something that I want you to do. And it's just as difficult for yourself to predict how you're going to react to something that you don't necessarily want to do. So A-B testing there is incredibly useful because it's a good way to observe how people actually react. Making a hypothesis based on empathy and research isn't necessarily going to get you any further. So A-B testing with extrinsic, user research with intrinsic. Very good idea. Now, on a similar topic, and this is my favorite slide of all of them, I don't know if you're watching Star Trek at all. If you don't, apologies, I will explain. So on the left-hand side, that is an empath. So this lady can sense emotions. On the right-hand side, the guy is called Data, which is why it illustrates my point that empathy and Data go hand in hand. And the reason I'm saying this is because it's very tempting to go one way or the other, right? If you build a product that you care a lot about, it's very tempting to just use yourself as the target group and just build what you like. But then the limits of that is where your users stop being like you are. And then the key is to start basically validating your assumptions with data, with setting key performance indicators, with watching what actually happens on your platform. <coughs> on the other hand, if you do it the data-driven way and you just set KPIs, um, then you're not going to understand what's actually happening in people. And because any KPI is a complete abstraction of kind of the messiness and complexity of how humans interact with your product, it is very dangerous to actually land up at a wrong conclusion. And I'll give you an example for this, right? So imagine you own a cafe, and you have a key performance indicator that says, I want to get more people in my cafe, right? So I'm watching people coming in, and I want that to be higher. Now, you come in on Monday, and you go, crap. I have lost 25% of people coming in every single day over the weekend. What on earth happened? And it's very tempting to then go, oh my god, oh my god, we have to fix it, we have to get more people and get more people in, right? But maybe if you investigated what actually happened, you'd see that somebody put up a sign that said, toilet use is only free for guests. And all of a sudden, all these people that just use your toilets for free are no longer coming in. So you actually only lost people that don't create any value for you, and you're actually using your resources more efficiently. But you won't find out whether that KPI means anything useful in human terms unless you combine it with the qualitative part of user research. 
Hence, I would suggest make sure these two are balanced. Don't use KPIs just as a pure objective. If you're doing anything user-driven, always think of the user story and validate it with KPIs instead of the other way around. Be on top of information architecture. And this is a lovely picture that reminds me of way too many software projects I've been in. I don't know if you feel the same. And what I mean with being on top of information architecture is this. Information architecture is how you design and craft the things that interact in your product, right? The objects, the concepts, the interactions. And it has both a user experience and a technical component. And if you do not do this intentionally, it will happen. There is no way to not have information architecture. But if you don't plan it, if you don't do it you know, with, with purpose, it's just going to happen in some way. And that might be as simple as the application you're building is a very rich application and wants to surface a lot of content very early on, for example, search results that already show ratings or a picture. But the APIs you're building are only optimized for performance. So you might get answers very quickly, but they actually don't contain the information that you're trying to surface up front, right? So to avoid that, get both design, product, and engineering involved and actually plan information architecture so that it doesn't just happen to you. Key user journeys are key. Now, this sounds very obvious, but let me explain what they're useful for. Key user journeys are a brilliant way of both communicating, giving focus, and kind of hinging a lot of the things you do in product around key concepts. A key user journey is any important flow that users, any of your personas, go through in your product. And what you can do with them is, first of all, they're brilliant to kind of avoid assumptions. People might have different assumptions of what's actually a key user journey without you making them very explicit and very obvious. And you can use them for things like doing user research. You can do sanity testing when you make big changes, right? Did we release a feature, but did it break something else from our key user journeys in return? That should be the first things you're automated testing against, right? So we never, ever have 100% automated test coverage. That just doesn't happen. But you really shouldn't have test coverage that is less than your key user journeys, because it'll really save you from trouble when you're releasing a lot of things, especially if you have to release them very quickly. So like information architecture, keep those concepts out in the open and explicit and talk about them. And they'll give you a lot of focus and make it easier for you to make decisions and make sure that these experiences really work across your different things that you're doing. And then we have less is more. I, in my case, less lunch is more. Otherwise, I would have made jokes about how eating less is a good idea. Um, when you build a lot of things very quickly, and startups do move very fast, it is incredibly tempting to just add things, to release more stuff. What else do we need to make our users happy? And I would strongly, strongly encourage you to take regular checkpoints where you check what can we take away. Just like you do refactoring in code bases, right? Figure out what's your conceptual debt. What are the things in your product that people aren't even using? Or maybe your strategy has changed, right? What needs to go? Same with just the user experience of screens. Every single choice the user has to make, and that choice can be as simple as, like, which of these 15 buttons do I click, adds additional fr uh, friction. It adds additional you know, overhead for people. And it will make your code base much more difficult to maintain. So it's actually going hand in hand. And sometimes you might feel like, this feature, you know, we talked a lot about this feature. We really thought this was our key feature. We promised it so much. I feel really bad if I'm taking it away. And I want to basically make a bold example of the statement that it is never too late to take something away. Because you may have remembered that my talk is actually called 10 Principles for Making Better Products. But during my trial runs, I realized that seven make a much more cohesive stories. Uh, story, and therefore my talk is now seven principles for building better products to illustrate this concept. And with this, um, I'm actually finishing early, so I have time for a few questions if anyone's interested. So thank you very much. And by the way, we're hiring, just in case you care, you know. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome to open a tech office in Cluj. Then you're very welcome to hire, otherwise you're not allowed to hire from here. <laughs> OK, so if you have a question to Jennifer, then please raise your hand. Dan, just wait for the microphone, just one second. Do we have a microphone up to Dan here? So
So my question is very easy. What for a position? What was that? <laughs> what, what position are you hiring for? <laughs> oh, we have lots of engineering positions open currently. So visionary? Hmm? Vis visionary position? I still the, get the it. The visionary quite. position is what you asked for. The visionary position? I still don't get it conceptually. <laughs> I think Dan is overqualified anyway. Okay. Yeah, he, we can talk after this question <laughs> session, and you can explain to me in detail. <laughs> okay, we have another question over here. You guys, if somebody else has a question after that, raise your hand right now, then we can already bring the second mic to you. I'll also be around, by the way, during coffee breaks, and I'm also on the Topi app. If you want to chat, just let me know. Um, so, hi. Thanks hi. for the talk. And uh, so you. Uh, talk about uh, getting out the things that users don't use, and uh, we don't. Sh we should not focus on things just to add more and more and more. But uh, how do we know what users will use or what will they will not mm -hmm. mm, before we add something new? So we should first add something new, right, to know what is used and what not. Maybe there's a key feature we add in the future, which user will love and will stay with the product for more time. So how do we know what to add and what to not? So I fully agree with you, right? So the way I'm envisioning this process is you keep trying new things, but don't forget to check independently of that, which of the old things you can leave out, right? Or if you see this isn't working, make sure you, you then actually remove it instead of just letting it die a slow, painful death. And Initial indication can come from user research, but again, the key user journeys are actually very interesting, right? So if what you're building has nothing to do with the key user journey, that is a good checkpoint to ask yourself, why are we adding this? Is it really relevant? Has our strategy changed? You know, what is not in tune? Is maybe just the user journey outdated? Maybe we have to change the user journey. But yeah, of course you need to be able to try new things. Just don't forget to check what old stuff you can throw out. Okay, thanks. Okay. Hi, great talk. Question your startup, you don't have much data. You rely only on empathy. Um, what was that, data and? Uh, empathy, you said like, mm -hmm. when you're refining a product, you should rely both on data and empathy. Yeah, so. The question was, if you don't have that much data yeah. in a startup. It's user research, right? Like, and try building in things. Obviously, it's the chicken and egg thing, right? Without the data, you don't know what's happening, but you need to understand what the needs of your users are to even build a product, right? So if you look at any of these pitches, they're always talking about what is the thing that you're trying to fix or the big problem you're trying to solve. So if you don't know what that need is and you don't do actually like research and talk to people that you work with and then observe them using your product, then there's no way, I think then you're making just random guesses. So my answer would be start with the user research and then observe, <coughs> try and build in, depending on what it is you're doing, try and build in data collection early enough so that you actually can observe, but really listen to people that use your products and see how it's working with their use case. Okay, thanks. Okay, right. thank you so much. Thank you. So that was great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks.